Hello, everyone. My name is Evan Amaral, and I am so thrilled to welcome you all to my new film series, New Cinematic Directions. You joined us back in 2019 for my first program at the Emory Cinematheque, not coming to a theater near you. You'll have a sense of what kinds of films you're going to see here. In keeping with that program spirit, all six screenings in this series are films you won't be able to see anywhere else in Atlanta. Even though theaters are still very much in various stages of reopening, I still wanted to highlight these kinds of brave new works that challenge the cultural hegemony of Hollywood product, along with the varieties of independent and art house cinema that maintain a place at the mainstream cinematic table. So that's why I chose new cinematic directions. Even though not all of these films are new in terms of their premieres, they're new to the majority of moviegoers. And this series is a way of giving them a platform and allowing you all our Emory Cinematheque audience to engage with them on your own terms and safely at home. For the past 20 odd years, Portuguese filmmaker Pedro Costa has been working with the inhabitants of a former slum outside of Lisbon, Fontainas, most of whom come from the former colony of Cape Verde. After making an impact on the international festival circuit with his early anti-colonial films like 1994's Jacques Tourneur riff, Casa de Lava, Costa made contact with the inhabitants of Fontainas while shooting his 1997 feature, Ossos, which was filmed there in a more neorealist style with some professional actors. From there, he grew closer with the people he was filming, with whom he would spend the next two decades shaping what Jordan Cronk calls collaborative nonfiction in his film comment interview with Costa from the magazine's January, February 2020 issue. Costa and his collaborators, among them the stars of the film you're about to see, spend years workshopping the films, working largely without a script and based on the performer's actual lives. And the film they're shot with extremely small crews uh, and they started shooting with mini DV video and at this point have eventually graduated to high definition digital. Vidalina Varela, Costa's latest film, takes its title from its subject and lead actress. Varela, in one of the most extraordinary close-up performances in cinema since Falconetti and The Passion of Joan of Arc, at least in my opinion, plays a loosely fictionalized version of herself. She arrived in Portugal shortly before the filming of Costa's previous film, 2014's Horse Money. She traveled there from Cape Verde to be with her husband, who had been living and working in Portugal for years, but found out upon arrival that he had recently died. And this is the starting point of Varela the film, which follows her as she joins the remaining lost souls of her husband's neighborhood, as they alternatively welcome and scorn her, worn down by the difficulties of their lives in Portugal. There she meets a suffering priest, played by Ventura, the lead of Horse Money and Costa's 2006 film Colossal Youth, who becomes a sympathetic figure in Varela's journey of grief and reconciliation, providing her a space to escape in his decaying church. Vitalina Varela, as it may sound, is an incredibly dark film. I mean that literally, too. Costa and cinematographer Leonardo Simoes Clark ev cloak every scene in black, zeroing in on empty, empty spaces and haunting silences in the corners of every frame. I should also note that Costa's style may be alienating to those unfamiliar, as it certainly was for me when I first started watching his films. His approach emphasizes stillness and quiet, lingering on incredibly long scenes that telegraph little narrative information. So while this may be a frustrating film at times, I recommend that you watch it in as close to complete darkness as you can create, with some good sound, whether that be headphones or your TV, and just let the experience wash over you. And if you struggle, that's more than okay. Just as its style suggests, Vitalina Varela is not a film that you watch and digest in the usual way. It's more of an encounter with a person whose grief and trauma are completely inaccessible to us. We simply must commune with her. And in this, Costa opens up another avenue for cinema's future. One in which we go to the movies to experience each other in the subtlest of ways. We don't have access to the, people's, the people on screens in our lives, but we can sit with them and watch them and observe what small details they've chosen to share with us in close up and in silence. I'll end here with a note from Costa from the film comment interview with Jordan Kronk that I quoted earlier. He says, and in the end, it's our turn to say goodbye to Vitalina. Every film must learn to say goodbye to its characters after all that Vitalina endured, it would have been too easy to condemn her to the purgatory of those four walls of her home. She must have her justice. She goes back to the very beginning, 
to the highest mountains, to the beginning of her love story with her husband, to the sparkle of love and happiness. Vitalina gave her heart and soul to this film. So in that sense, it is good work. Not better or worse than other work, but it's good work, useful work. In the end, we rejoin something I believe that cinema must go on doing, keeping the flame alive. Please do consider joining me and your fellow viewers for our open discussion of this film on Tuesday, March 9th at 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. And please do enjoy the film.